Well, thank you for having me here. I'm actually a professor in mechanical engineering of all places. And uh, first, a disclosure of the previous talk, those of you who were here, I understood just about none of the acronyms that were being used. I don't know. I, I hope that somebody would translate, you know, what all the different things are. But as far as developing my app, uh, it really didn't matter very much. So my app, let me, let me. Uh, my app is actually an encryption app. Uh, it started about three years ago when I got extremely paranoid about my email. Uh, I was using, like most people here at IIT, we use Google. And I was concerned that the moment that you type anything into a Compose win window in Google, will they have everything that I'm typing? And normally, normally uh, it will be sent through their servers, and if the other recipient is on Google too, well, they say that it will never come out of an encrypted environment. All the connections between machines are, are encrypted. But if it goes out into a different server, well, it will not be encrypted. It's like writing on a postcard. So I, I wanted to do something about it, and little by little, uh, a program was developed that is called PassLock. And you can find it at passlock.com. And, and they has, it has right now, it has two different flavors. There is a standalone sort of version of PassLock, which is a web app. And there is another version, which started uh, last April, which is actually uh, integrates with common webmail programs like Gmail, Yahoo Mail, and Outlook. It's, a, it's an extension that runs both on Chrome and on Firefox. And well, and it has some WebRTC capabilities, which is, uh, I guess, what I was invited to, to talk about here. But its primary, pur primary pur purpose is to encrypt email so that uh, the server actually never sees uh, the, the plain text of what you're doing. Now, I must also um, reveal that I'm very server averse, extremely server averse. Here I find a lot of people who talk with great enthusiasm about their servers and what a server uh, does and how is it better. To me, the server is the enemy because the server can be compromised. It can be hacked. It can be served a subpoena. And the user will never know that it has happened. And they have lost all security at that point. So my app is pretty much exclusively client-based. It's, it's completely written in JavaScript. And the way RTC uses servers to a minimum extent, which I'll try to, to show how that is done. All right, so let's imagine, I, I apologize because it's kind of small. I wanted to, to fit the whole conversation on the screen, but I hope that you can more or less see. I'll read what is happening. So we have two people here, Alice and Bob. They are exchanging some emails, and it begins with Alice at 4.30 p.m. saying, hey, Bob, do you have the picture for the ad ready? And he replies five minutes later over email, yes, I'm attaching it here. Then Alice answers at five minutes later, can you make the face of the person holding the product a little rounder? And one minute later, she said, and the skin darker, please. Then Bob, five minutes later, just her or the other faces too. Then Alice at 4.50, I guess the children too, but I don't want the man to look like her brother. Okay, so Bob says at 4.55, no problem, anything else? I got a bus, a bus to catch in 10 minutes. And then at 5 p.m., Alice, I guess that'll be it, thanks. One minute later, actually, can you increase the saturation on the product box a little? Okay, and then at 5.05, .05, Bob says, I thought I, it would look gaudy if I did that. I got, I got to go, though. At 5.10, Alice, it's no, it's got to be more saturated. I got a bus to catch, too. And Bob says at 5 or 6, Hi, Alice, it's good to go. I'm attaching the picture. You can saturate the product if you want. Alice, 512. Sorry, Bob, but I don't have a photo editor right here. Alice, at 520. Bob, did you get my last email? I need this now. At 525. Bob, are you there? 530. Bob. Okay. So basically, she's wasted a whole hour, and probably it didn't get done. And that's because email has an inherent delay there. You know, every time that you, while you wait for the message to reach the server and it gets to your machine, 
for your uh, client to fetch it. It might take sometimes uh, five minutes. Gmail is pretty good about that, but Yahoo is notorious for being slow in fetching things. And it might take 10, 20 minutes before a message, a message gets through, something you maybe you send to yourself. So wouldn't it be nice if at some point Alice and Bob could switch from this? Obviously, they're both online at the same time. They could switch into a real-time conversation seamlessly, not having to fire another, another app. Please, no Slack, no another button to click, not uh, anything. Just stay where you are and then just switch into real-time communication without involving Google. So no Hangouts either. They don't want anything of this to transpire outside of, of themselves. Suppose, furthermore, that they say that they are really paranoid about security. I mean, this was just an ad, but it could have been the, the call for a nuclear launcher, okay? And they don't want anybody to hack into them. They don't want to burden their machines. They want to get it out. And rather not have to log in or have another account or anything. Okay, so that's what Passlog is supposed to do. So it consists of asymmetric encryption, and it works for text and files. Uh, we use uh, elliptic curves for that. It's 100% JavaScript. And it has three modes, and maybe if people have a chance to test it, you can tell me that's too much. You know, the, the regular is, um, is regular, so you can read a message after that later. You can review it as many times as you want, so long as you supply your password. Hidden is that it doesn't look like you have encrypted anything. So that's, that's a thought for place places where people might live in a repressive regime. They're getting their, their email filtered or something. It won't look like it's encrypted at all. And read once is like we saw in the previous uh, presentation. Should you wish to accept it, you know, you can accept it because this message cannot be read again, period. It just cannot be read again. The, uh, it's through uh, self-destruct messaging through email. Uh, well, I've mentioned this before, and there is a WebRTC module which I did not develop. I left it straight out of a web page by Muaz Khan at github.com. And in fact, uh, as I found out, I'm using an older version. The new versions that he's got is a very popular um, site on, on GitHub. It has done something that you need to head set up your own server. I really don't understand it. So I'm, I'm sticking with the old version that uses a commercial server that might be safe or not. You might tell me because I, I don't understand the difference either. All right. So the way it connects to, to stars at WebRTC is that you create an invitation in Passlog. So Alice is going to make, assume that is Alice the one who initiates this. It's going to make a special message which uh, contains these fields. Everything is very small. So it just has the type of chat that it is. Okay, I cannot, but here it is. The type of chat, so it has three types of chat, text, audio, and video. Uh, a little text area, very small, just so you can write the, the time when it's going to be. You know, you don't want to be trying to connect at the wrong time. Uh, they have a generic chat room name because it's going to connect through a commercial server, through Firebase. And it's going to be, try to be as nondescript as possible. And then there is a password that is 256 bits. And if uh, the other side doesn't have it, there won't be a connection. OK. Then she's going to encrypt it, or password is going to encrypt it, with Bob's public key, which Atlas has, and with her own as well. So she can, she can also decrypt that message again. And then she says it to Bob. Okay, and the email server will keep a copy, but it won't be able to decrypt it because only Bob and herself have the key. Now, on Bob's side, so he gets the encrypted message and, it, and password decrypts it with his private key. Then the software recognizes it as an invitation and displays the text before it does anything else. So maybe it's not the time, so he'll do it later again. And if it clicks OK, then is when really the WebRTC code is going to load. It loads in a separate tab or in an iframe in the standalone version. So it really has nothing to do. It's completely separate of the normal code of Passlog. And it's going to contact Firebase 
and it's going to send the chat room name. Firebase will make the chat room, and um, it's going to send, uh, well, it's not going to send. Firebase is going to look up Bob's IP address and put it in a, in a cubby hole, waiting for other people to come and join and do the same. But the password is not sent. So the password set, stays on Bob. Firebase never sees it. Meanwhile, Eyeless is going to decrypt her own message, and it's going to do exactly the same thing, except that now Firebase knows that the chat has been initiated. There's a copy hole with that name, and it's going to um, send a join button. And when she does that, Firebase will look up her IP address, and which will be sent to Bob, and will send uh, to Alice Bob's IP address, and then the programs will try to connect directly. Okay, so it's just a straight, plain vanilla signal in server. Probably this has been evolved. I don't know if it hasn't evolved into something better now. And I wish that there was no need to have any server at some point, but apparently you cannot see your own IP address. Somebody needs to give it to you from the outside. Um, okay, and then they connect each other, and they're on. And it's a very simple page that you're invited to check out anytime you want. It also involves supplying, at that point, the password. And if the password is not supplied correctly, then the connection fails, and there is no connection there. So it's just normal where you to see. You know, it's going to be text or audio or even video. When they are done, they just close the tabs or iframes, and that's it. Firebase may have a copy of that a, a, a chat took place under this chat, num, chat room name, and these were the IP numbers, but it, that's all it's going to know. Nothing about the content of the, um, of the talk, and if there was uh, a VPN or Tor being used, well, they'll just have IP addresses, but those are, are ephemeral as well. So it basically won't have anything. No one saw the content. The email server has the invitation, which you cannot decrypt. So, so that's it. And still don't have each other's private key. So it's over. And if you're uh, using read once mode, then you cannot open it again. You know, it's, it's dead for all pur practical purposes. There's no record that this conversation ever took place. So I have some questions for you, all right? Without having seen this, you know, uh, you can tell me maybe later if um, read once is something that might be interesting or, or not, or not. Um, what could be done to be, to be made easier or more secure? Also, I have my questions about Firebase. You know, is there a better way? Is there a better um, where IPC kind of code to use than the real simple demo type that seems to work pretty well anyway that I just ripped up out of, out of GitHub, you know, with do attribution and, and so forth. But it's completely public domain and real simple. That's it. Thank you. Oh, yeah, we have questions. Yeah. Thank you. So two questions, um, and, and the first might be because perhaps I didn't understand it, but aren't, you know, the first question is, aren't we replacing Google server with Firebase servers? And the second question is, you require a shared secret between the communicating parties. So therefore, if you're going to talk to somebody who you've never talked to before, then you cannot exchange the shared secret. Okay, so about the shared secret, we're not talking about the 256-bit password for the chat. There needs to be a prior communication, encrypted communication through email between the two participants or whatever number of participants. So that means that you must have installed Passlock as an extension or as a web app, really. And the web app is a little more complicated because then you actually send your public key to the other person. But it's real simple. It's only 50 characters long. Okay. Once you have the, the um, public key of the other person, then you're, for all practical purposes, connected. The version that attaches to email the moment that you reply the first time to an invitation from somebody else, you're connected. And you don't have to worry about uh, storing keys or anything. The program does that automatically under that person's email. 
So after you have established a communication by email, then is when this thing can kick in. Okay, but did you explore anything else like Diffie-Hellman exchange or... What kind of exchange? Oh, it is Diffie-Hellman. It is Diffie-Hellman exchange. All right, then perhaps I need to understand this a little bit better. Yeah, but well, then I didn't bring any details of the actual encryption here because this is about the WebRTC component. But underneath it all, there is an elliptic curve Diffie-Hellman using curve 255.19, which is very much in vogue now. And the public keys, are you deriving these from X509 certificates or are these self-signed the certificates? Public, the public keys derived directly from the private key. The private key is 256 bits and derives from your password using, um, what is it called, uh, a script, a variable, okay. round, variable number of rounds of a script using a fairly complicated entropy measurement. Okay, so that goes back to the Firebase question. So the Firebase question is that we, is it having to replace Google with Firebase? Because some privacy is lost because Firebase knows that two parties communicated. Yes, they, they know that. I, I'd rather that they didn't, but it's, it's, I try to disguise it as much as possible. They don't know it's you except f from your IP number. Yeah, thank you. I, yeah. Yeah, uh, pretty good. Uh, talk. Uh, I don't know if I understood. You said that you make it look like it's not encrypted. Yes, it is possible. If you have text, it can be re-encoded as something else, some different text. So you're basically taking all the characters, you're converting that into sort of, sort of binary, and you can encode that into the spaces, into a normal text, into the length of the sentences. You can change some characters that look like an A, like a Latin A, but it's actually a Cyrillic A. Looks the same to the eye, but it's encoding the message. And maybe the message you can read is an ad or spam or a, a fraction of a novel, whatever. But the program is able to decode it and extract the actual message from that. And, and can this be done for many different variety of messages, or will it limit your... Uh, uh, messages that you can send? No, no, you can send you can send files, yeah. And you're only limited by the capacity of the browser to handle files. So if you want to send a file within the body of the message, you're limited to two megabytes because at least Chrome will not handle anything bigger than that. Uh, if you want to go about that, then they, you need to en encrypt it first as a file and then you send it as an attachment. And then you're not limited anymore. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, thank you. So uh, I, I, if we have time, we will do a, a panel discussion. There will be more opportunity for questions at the end. Okay. Um, next, I'd like to uh, invite up um, Zusong Mai. Of, uh, in, in case you weren't aware, we're actually live streaming uh, all these sessions right now through a platform called Big Marker. Uh, Zusong is actually the CEO. Um, and founder of Big Marker, and he'll be uh, just giving us a, a quick walkthrough of that and talking about how he incorporates WebRTC um, and some of his challenges, including WebRTC, and some of the great things about it. Okay, while, while that's uh, loading, hi, my name is uh, Ju Song Mei. I'm the founder and CEO of BigMarker.com. So we are a, a online webinar platform or online webinar network that allow people to find um, uh, similar uh, conferences that they're passionate about. So basically a place to find webinars on topics you're passionate about, and it's also 
a place to host them. So I was going to start with, uh, I don't know how to use this trackpad. There we go. Just by going into um, our streaming session. So, so we're e like, So this is the, actually the, the conference room that we're streaming today. And for uh, momentarily, I should appear on the screen and I can check my posture. Because I usually, that's not loading for some reason. All right, so while that's load, um, also show so I, the idea of big market came out to me about um, six years ago so I was taking care of my mother as uh, she was going through uh, cancer treatments and while she was going through cancer treatments and uh, uh, you know helping her through chemotherapy um, after each session, I see how you know sad and depressed she is. That you know, I thought it would be nice if she can connect with other people going through similar things. Um, at that time, she was pretty weak and really did, doesn't want to go out. So you know, the idea was like, well, you know, there's um, a lot of really good video conferencing platforms out there. Why don't we have a open video conferencing platform where people with similar interests and passion can get together and you know find uh, the topics they're passionate about and find people with similar interests and get together um, virtually. So that was uh, how, it, how it started. Um, so that's um, still a, a signature feature of our website where people can come and browse different kind of uh, webinars uh, on their topic. So if you go to bigmarker.com slash discover, you'll see you know, a different type of uh, webinars um, that's, um, that people host. So many people host uh, you know, different kind of like, you know, uh, marketing webinars, uh, uh, programming webinars. Uh, this morning we had, I don't know how to use this trackpad. And this morning we had um, some um, conferences that's going on from uh, uh, programmers around the world that they can discuss uh, different things. So. See if I jump into a demo and actually show you with the conference room. So when we first started out, I'll just go back to the home page, it looks nicer. So anyways, um, in terms of the, um, how we got it started, um, when we first started, we actually used uh, Flash um, as the way to do the MCU, to do the mixing of all the video and, and audio. Um, but in 2011, when WebRTC came out, we started experimenting with it. Um, in, so after a year of uh, development, um, so we basically spent most of our time in 2013 to develop um, to turn that really into you know, experiments with WebRTC uh, for video conferencing. And, and then in 2014, we really switched out all our uh, Flash components into uh, WebRTC components. So now our entire site, entire conference room is based in uh, WebRTC. So in 2014, uh, we were actually um, you know, made the headlines in WebRTC world 
to be the first WebRTC based web on platform to reach uh, a, a hundred people. Uh, so now we can scale up to a thousand people and pretty soon we'll be able to scale uh, significantly more um, upwards of um, you know 30 to 50,000 uh, connections. Uh, I really want to do that demo so hopefully it will load it by 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 Okay. That tends to happen if it's in the same room. Okay, all right, finally a little bit. So here is our conference room. Uh, when you open, you can choose your cameras. And um, so there's, um, this is a, the, the layout of our conference room where you have a presentation space. Um, you can, and if you remove the presentation, the video goes to the middle. Um, in this uh, part, you can have up to nine people um, sharing their cameras, and you can, uh, and if there's a camera, I mean, if there's a presentation or a uh, YouTube video or a, a video playing, that will take up this space. Um, so I can bring back the, uh, the uh, presentation, and it was showing here. Uh, yeah, I can, that will probably look a little bit better. So I can move the cameras around. Um, as you can see, so, uh, the, you know, the good thing about moving to WebRTC is uh, before we were in Flash, we had to pro you know, program it in two different languages or multiple different languages. Uh, Flash Builder was a pretty big pain in the butt. And uh, when we moved to WebRTC, all we had to worry about is just like CSS and JavaScript. And um, uh, that makes, uh, that gives us a tremendous amount of flexibility in terms of adding new features and adding new capabilities. Um, so right now we're going to do you know, screen sharing, um, uh, uh, play YouTube videos, share um, MP4 videos, and um, um, anything you want to do with a, uh, in JavaScript we're going to do it in the conference room. That's uh, do you have any questions? Yeah, are there any uh, questions for uh, this song? I, mean, I, I have a point one, I guess. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about your media server architecture? Are you doing you know, real-time streams for when you send this out to a large audience of 1,000, or is that, uh, are you going still going through a CDN network? Um, yeah, so we, um, when we first started, we were using um, open source um, servers. Uh, but eventually, um, since uh, 2014, we actually built our own uh, WebRTC-based streaming server. So everything is very real time. Um, so when people see this, I mean, see what see me earlier. I mean, is there's um, minimal uh, delays or latency, so people show up right away. And um, you know, that's um, one of the reasons a lot of people use this us versus Google Hangouts or Google. Hangouts on air is like, you know, hang out on air, there's like a 90 second delay versus for us is instantaneous. So it's very easy for people to have a, just like a streaming conversation that you can just, you know, when, when the presentation is going, when people want to chime in with your chats and they ask a question, it's, it's all in real time. There's no okay. delays. Are there any other questions? All right. Then, uh, Aaron, uh, next I'd like to introduce uh, Aaron Syme of WebRTC Ventures. Uh, Aaron actually founded a uh, really a web development shop that's uh, come to focus uh, more or less exclusively on WebRTC. So I asked him to share some of his uh, insights um, and experiences uh, going through and in, in why, why focus on WebRTC. Hi. Uh, so as Chad said, uh, my name's Aaron Syme uh, from Virginia, and uh, my background is not at all in telephony or telecom. So uh, as Chad noted at the beginning, um, it does create a different perspective coming into this. Uh, my background is in web development <clears throat> and uh, started a company uh, with my business partner about five years ago doing kind of more generic web development, didn't have anything to do with WebRTC. Uh, but we were building a lot of applications that involved real-time messaging of some sort, like um, uh, 
uh, data dashboards and things where uh, uh, and collaboration tools where a lot of data did have to be exchanged between the browsers real time, not video or audio at that point. But it did get us interested in the topic of real time web and real time communications in general. And then uh, I was at a HTML5 conference, I think was the first place I heard about, uh, or first place I saw a presentation about WebRTC maybe four years ago now, if I remember right, I'm not certain. Um, and uh, anyways, uh, thought this is really cool uh, and uh, this is a perfect niche for us to move into as developers uh, because we're, we're already into real-time data transfer and, and uh, that sort of thing, so let's add in video because that'll be really cool, right? So uh, over the uh, next year or so, we started uh, experimenting with it internally and building some internal products just to get familiar with it and then took on a customer or two who were interested in uh, adding video into their applications. And then starting a little over a year ago, we added, uh, changed our brand to WebRTC.Ventures and now uh, all of the marketing and outreach that we do as a company is exclusively focused on building applications around video and it's the majority of the work that we do as a company now and, and we're, we're growing doing that. Um, and um, uh, in, in fact, I have some kind of pseudo-scientific, not uh, great polling numbers, but, but some pseudo-numbers that I can show in a presentation that I'm doing tomorrow morning about trends in WebRTC development that kind of give you a sense of just what people are asking us for. Um, because when you do, uh, you know, Google search on WebRTC development or, or development companies, there's not very many names that, that come up, but it's definitely a growing space. So we've had an opportunity to work on uh, WebRTC apps in a number of different sectors, including telehealth and broadcast and webinar type of tools uh, and uh, social media customer support. So just want to um, mention two of those now just as an example of use cases, and uh, I'll try to quickly address a couple of things that we learned uh, doing that. Um, so this is a product, uh, most of what we do is services development in our company. You can hire us to build your application, uh, but we're also building products of our own. And this is a product of ours that uh, is in beta right now that we're launching called Usability. And uh, this is for doing product research. So imagine that you have uh, a web-based application, you know, say you're Amazon, you just added some cool new features into your shopping cart and you want to get some users to try it out and tell you what they think about it. So this application will let you intercept users in real time, live visitors to your website, and ask them to do a screen, uh, screen sharing session with you and uh, you know, ask, give them some mission. Uh, can you go find this product, put it in your cart, and check out? And I just want to watch you do it. You're gonna, your camera's going to be turned on by WebRTC. You're going to share your screen. And we'll get to watch you use this new cool feature that we built. And along the way, product researchers in a situation like this, they're looking for you to scratch your head. So the video is really helpful to see, you know, can they figure out where you hid that cool new feature or is it too hidden, right? Uh, so you're kind of giving them a challenge in your product and seeing how they're, they're going. So uh, in, in this particular screenshot, we have our, our user and their video on the bottom right. This is the view that the product researcher has. On the left-hand side, most prominently, we have the screen share uh, because we're, we're really interested to see the details of where they're moving the mouse, of course. And on the right, as the researcher, we can take notes. And all of these notes get time-stamped with the recording of this session so that later on I can go back and I can look at the recording from the session and I can see, oh, what was that point where I, as the researcher, I made a note that they were scratching their head or they said this stinks, right? And I click on that note and it goes to that part of the video. Now I can pull out that part of the video and send it to my product manager who insisted on the placement of the button there and say, look, customers are telling me it stinks. I told you it was going to stink, right? <laughs> so you can use it for that sort of, uh, you know, clipping of the video and getting real evidence from customers, which is, of course, huge. As well, um, there's kind of a... Um, uh, what do you call those, oh, like a one-way mirror, uh, if I have that term right, um, where there's, a, there's another link that I can have other people in my team as silent observers of these sessions too. So as the researcher, I'm the only one who can talk to the customer, uh, but other people I can give them a link if they just want to watch and they want to listen, and they can also make notes along the way. Um, they're not going to talk to the, uh, the, the test subject. Um, but they can still make notes. They can also chat with me as the researcher and say, hey, ask, ask them to do this, please. 
Uh, so this is a, a, a tool that, uh, like I said, we've, we've built and it's in beta now. Um, we built it, uh, we built this on top of a, a talk box and, and it's kind of an interesting thing uh, whether you're looking at any particular uh, uh, video platform as a service. Doesn't necessarily matter in the sense, but I, I think it's interesting when you're kind of in a startup mode and you don't know yet if you've got this idea of whether or not this product is going to be viable. There's the buy or build question, essentially. You know, do I want to build my own WebRTC infrastructure from scratch, or do I want to go use one of these platforms? Since we work with a lot of startups and a lot of times they come to us with a pretty limited budget, my advice in general is, is let's pick one of those platforms for you and let's build with that initially because the most important thing for you is to get your product idea out in the market as fast as possible and as cheaply as possible and then let's just see if it works, if customers are actually going to pay for your product because you are a startup, you don't know that yet. And then if you see that customers are willing to pay for your product, it's got traction and you want to scale to thousands and thousands of uh, viewers at once or whatever, and you feel like maybe the platform costs of one of those providers is getting too high, then we can talk about going back and kind of redoing the architecture to be a more custom WebRTC uh, infrastructure that maybe is going to take more time to develop, but will be something that you own completely. Um, and um, so that kind of conversation I think is interesting and, and important to have early in your product of, you know, how do I want to build this? Because of course, the way you start doesn't have to be the way you end with the product. So as somebody who is a big fan of lean startup stuff, I always favor the side of let's just get something out there as quick as we can and see if people like it. And then we'll figure out if there's a better, you know, better or different way we want to build it technically. Um, so uh, let's talk about the next one then. Um, so this is a, a example of, of what a lot of the applications that people ask us to build are like basically think of it as just an expert consultation platform. Uh, could be for telehealth, it could be lawyers, accountants. Uh, we've had people ask for a variety of different niches that they want to serve with a tool like this. But basically, I want to look through a directory of experts. I want to search through and find the expert who can serve my needs best. I want to book a session with them, set up you know uh, an appointment on their calendar. And then at that time, I'm going to get a reminder. I'm going to come into a video call like this, and I want to screen share, and I want to trade files and stuff, right? And how is that any different than using a go-to meeting or some you know commercial tool? There, the the difference, and this is of course one of the beauties of WebRTC, is is that it's a lower onboarding cost to get someone into the call, and that's really important in this tool for product research, for example, because you may be talking to any sort of consumer about your product, not somebody who, like all of us, is used to using conferencing tools every day and probably has a dozen installed on our laptops. Your consumers may have never been in, in any sort of conferencing tool before and may not really even be sure what Hangouts is, right? So, so if they agree to a product research session with you, you just want to give them a link, kind of like the uh, the the appear.in founder was talking about, just give them a link and get them into the call right away. And then with a tool like this or with an expert's platform like this, the point is that you go straight from the link into the conversation that, that the customer really wants, no other overhead or onboarding cost of, of some other tool. And so that's, of course, uh, to me anyways, that's a huge promise of uh, WebRTC. So... That's kind of a quick overview of a couple of products we built. I'll stop there. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Sure. I, I did a very poor job of managing time, and we're probably not going to have time for the panel session at the end. So I would say if you do have questions, go ahead and ask Aaron now, um, and then we'll let uh, Vladimir spend 10 or 15 minutes or so with his, uh, going through his, his demos. Nothing? I think, I think people are, are, are eager for the uh, reception and beer. Actually, one, one question, Francisco, up front. <laughs> no, I was just wondering, I mean, you have beautiful samples of uh, web RTC clients. Do you happen to have uh, one that you wouldn't mind putting in the open domain? We can attach it to my app, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of the UI? You yeah. Um, well... I guess we don't have one that that is like a UI framework or something that uh, you can plug into other things. That's, um, I mean, it's really not plugging into anything. It just yeah. has its own tab and it just does. 
but uh, it will need to be open sourced. Right, right. Um, so I guess we haven't really thought about it that way or, or mm -hmm. produced something like that. What I will say is if you look at a number of the different um, uh, WebRTC platforms that are out there and providers, a lot of them do have sample projects mm -hmm. that do have a, you know, here's how to build a chat tool with our particular platform, and they'll give you the complete product. Mm -hmm. um, and you can take one of those and, and pull out their video platform and put yours in it if you want and still have gotten the basic UI layout from them if you want to, you know, just have something to start with. Our, our specialty as a company is, is uh, taking our UX and design team as well as our knowledge of WebRTC platforms and, and kind of customizing it to your specific needs. So, so mm -hmm. that's why we haven't really thought so much about what's the most generic thing that could be used in the most cases and put it out there as open source. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Aaron. All right, any other questions now that Vladimir wants you to uh, come up? So uh, next I'll uh, introduce Vladimir Beladorodov. Probably messed it up. Hopefully it's close enough. Uh, Vl Vladimir is a uh, solutions manager at uh, Mara Software, uh, another development firm. I, I kind of define uh, Vlad here as a telecom telephony guy because he, he knows it pretty well. Uh, but a lot of the... Uh, I'd say experiments and uh, hacks and other things he does uh, are absolutely not traditional telephony and trying to push the bounds of uh, what you can do with WebRTC and different types of applications. So he agreed to, uh, to, to show some demos for us here today. Yeah, uh, let me just do a few quick demos. Uh, I, I, I will not share any slides, guys. Uh, I will want to use them. Oh, yeah. I need to use mic. Um, well, I, I actually, I hope that the audience can, can hear me anyway. So. Yeah, well, I, I will possibly need to, to just wander around as well. Uh, so I, I will not uh, join this into the projector, but I hope you will be able to see. Uh, what I started right now on my uh, tablet and my phone is a kind of very simplified version of a traditional uh, teleconference application where you just have, you know, talking heads, if you will, uh, the remote side and the local side. And it's built in WebRTC and so and some secret technology behind it. But the reason that I build it uh, is not to show you that you can uh, just you know, talk to someone else like you do with Skype or Hangouts or something else like you would be doing traditionally. But instead, uh, it's something that you actually can plug in to something like this. And in this case, we have a kind of traditional video conference, but in a slightly different way, in a way that allows me not only to see and interact with people remotely by talking to them, you know, but also in a way that allows me to control a remote object, a remote machine in this case. And this all happens with WebRTC because the WebRTC has three components. It has the video, real-time video, real-time audience, real-time data channel. And I was always interested in using data channel together with the media channels to build something more exciting. So this uh, was a prototype that I built a couple of years ago. I first showed that uh, at Paris WebRTC conference uh, back in 2014. And uh, the whole purpose of that was to show people that we can use data channel for the real-time control of remote objects, and it's viable, and it's, you know, it's working. I, I'm trying to be careful because, you know, I don't want to sit down in front from the table, of course, but, you know, uh, as long as it's on the floor, I definitely can be much more. No, this one is uh, is using a matrix. Uh, I mean, if, if you if if you talk about the initial signaling that I'm using for these two guys to find each other, that's matrix.org. One of the guys uh, who sponsored this event. I'm actually quite a big fan of what they're doing. I uh, know that for many years. So I, I'm using their servers for the kind of you know, uh, experiments. Yeah. So uh, this, this thing is actually uh, shows you that you can do real-time communications and real-time control like this. The funny story about it, I presented it uh, at Paris show back in 2014, actually it happened to 
to receive the best daily channel uh, award of the show that year. And next year, I went to that same show with, I, I was presenting a different topic, but at that show next year, 2015 in Paris, uh, guys from Ericsson were just presenting the, their own research. And they suddenly showed the project. I don't know if you've heard about that one, but they built uh, a real machine. I mean, the real big machine, industrial one, where they connected uh, some cameras and they were controlling now that big object with uh, the FRTC with data channel. And I made a joke at the conference that, you know, I'm glad that during the year my small robot grown that huge. Uh, in, just, in just less than 12 months. And the audience was laughing because most of them actually saw, saw this one a year before. So that's one thing that I wanted to show you real quick. Um, I will um, just real quick shut down this now right now. Uh, and the other <coughs> thing that I will show you, it will resemble uh, this scene a little bit, but in slightly, slightly different way. So the other demo that I will show you right now is also using voice video and data channel. <coughs> so this time, uh, what I wanted to do, I wanted, I wanted to create an app that would use a non-conventional source of the video to uh, something So, with this one, just how many of you guys know what thermal imaging is? Infrared cameras and stuff. Have you ever thought about using that stuff with video uh, repetition? Hello. So I will put this one here now again. I hope you can see the screen. So here is my local phone. Here is my tablet. And I will now, guys, just go and measure the temperature <laughs> of some of you. I hope you don't mind. Uh, but you can see in this audience we have some real people. <laughs> no cyborgs, you know. <laughs> but so what happens here? This is the thermal camera from a company called Clear. And I modified uh, the FRTC stack from Google to be able to use this non-conventional external source and stream video in real time. Uh, well, it also includes the audio connection, just uh, uh, faded down audio so we have no echo. But in addition to that, again, data channel. What it allows us to do, it allows me to transmit the actual measurement of the temperature from my phone to the remote side in real time. So this is a real tool because that can be used in telemedicine, that can be used for inspecting insulation in houses. That is a great tool to actually deal with different plumbing problems because most people don't realize it, but with a thermal camera, if you have pro problems with the water not coming through pipes, in a non-invasive place, in many cases, you can actually detect the place where something bad happens. And you can then show that remotely to the, to the person, uh, the plumber, who will be coming, and if the person is trained in the scene, he or she can just look at that and say, hey, you know, that's, that's an easy thing. I know what I need to, to bring with me. Or no, this, this will require you know, changing everything. And, uh, you know, stuff, stuff, stuff like that. So medical thing, uh, inspecting uh, the different types of uh, refrigeration equipment or automobiles, lots of things like that. So again, those applications, they show you that you know, we have uh, the kind of you know, non-conventional uh, applications for, uh, for VRPC, where we do have a voice and video component, like in traditional video calls. But on top of that, at video uh, uh, data channel, we can do something really interesting in real time. So I hope you enjoyed it, guys. And that's what I have for you today. <laughs> Thanks, uh, any any questions? I, I I had a quick one. Did you uh, reverse engineer the, uh, the the Romo to take over, or no, did you no. hijack it? Fortunately, no. Uh, you know, my my principle. I love toys like this in the case if they provide 
free SDKs for developers. Okay, all right. So the they moment I saw a toy that provides a free SDK for developer, I got interested. Okay. So that was the case. Here. All right. Simon. Hi. Uh, I was just wondering whether or not you're using some, let's say, standard means of transporting the co-op protocol on top of the data channel, because actually there are drafts related to this, and this yeah. is really definitely interesting, I would say. That's for sure. Uh, well, in, in my case, I intentionally tried to do a custom one. Uh, I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't have uh, to transmit, you know, lots of complex data. So in that case, it's a kind of JSON-based protocol. Well, the, the reason for that is because I also can use that same thing, repurpose it, to show some of my research in the area of, uh, uh, you know, uh, tracing and debugging applications. So it's okay, a mul multi-purpose demo in this case, but I definitely, I, I could go with binary protocols like MTTT, for instance. Yeah, actually, this would be 100% compatible with the standards-based IoT framework whereby you use co-op and IPS objects for mapping the, the robot and the other things that you're managing. So I, I think it's straightforward. Well, Very nice. Thank you. You know, the, the, the only thing to note here, uh, again, my purpose was also to use the data channel in WebRTC because we can, in this case, go peer-to-peer -peer because all the, the, there were some projects before, like robotics, that did use WebRTC for voice and media. But then the control of the truck will be going something else like a web socket and all this will be going through the server. So yeah. my whole purpose was, hey, we can go peer to peer, yeah. which in case with IoT applications for collecting data may be not the viable, but in case of applications that control something, because control by essence is kind of peer to peer, right? Yeah. So this is where it's very viable from my perspective. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Any, uh, any last ones before break time? No? Well, I, I'd like to uh, thank all our, our panelists. That was great. I'm sure they'd be happy to, to talk more uh, during the reception. Well, we'll see you there. <laughs>